Good morning, Wilshire. It is my great pleasure to bring back to Wilshire this morning Josh Houston. Many of y'all might remember Josh. He grew up here at our church and now serves in Austin with Texas Impact as their general counsel and director of government affairs. Can you believe that? <laughs> Texas Impact um, is a new partner for us this year in the work of advocacy. They are a multi-faith network of sorts that brings together um, different faith groups, think Christian, Jewish, Muslim, to come around the issues of social concern that their traditions hold in common. I want you to think of our mission partners, immigrants, refugees, criminal justice, hunger, poverty. Those are the main issues that many of our mission partners share, and Texas Impact helps to teach us and mobilize us to be engaged in advocacy and public policy to make systemic change that positively impacts our community. And so I'm so grateful that we have a familiar face with this new partner. We are in good hands. And so I'm excited to talk a little bit this morning with Josh. So Josh, welcome back home. Thank you. We're so glad to have you here. Um, so one of the questions that I got a lot when we first started this advocacy work and something that we continue to get is, I thought y'all were Baptists. Why are you engaged in advocacy? Don't you care about the separation of church and state? Talk to us about why this is a wonderful expression of faith for Baptists to be engaged in this type of work. So Baptists have had lobbyists since before there was America, actually. Uh, <laughs> before there was a constitution in 18, uh, 1787, uh, Baptist employed lobbyists because they were very involved in disestablishment struggles, which is what they called separation of church and state in that time. Uh, John Leland, a Baptist minister, was personal friends with Thomas Jefferson, said, let a man worship one God, three gods, 20 gods or no gods, let it be no business of government. Now, Madison, uh, James Madison, wrote, and he was a big uh, proponent of, of church-state separation. He was actually elected by Baptist. His district, uh, he was drawn into a, a di uh, district full of Baptists because uh, Patrick Henry didn't like him. Uh, it turns out that Madison, for 15 years, had been working in Virginia before there was a U.S. Constitution on church-state separation issues, and that's largely why the Baptists backed him. Um, so Madison's view was is that faith, faith groups, any faith group, is one faith among many. They're one interest group among many. They're one uh, sect among many. And so you have many voices in a democracy that uh, are supposed to be participating in the public policy process. Uh, in order to lend that voice. Um, it is really a constraint on what government can do, uh, what authority government has over matters of religion, not the other way around. Thank you for helping to clarify that for us. So for our advocacy ministry has been around for just over two and a half years now. In some ways that feels really fast. Um, but people might mean, believe that that means that we haven't been doing this work for very long. But I think your life is proof to us that the work of advocacy and social justice here at Wilshire has long roots. Tell us a little bit about what you learned here growing up at Wilshire that led you to understanding your call and vocation is intimately tied to advocacy and public witness. So for 40 years, the lobbyist for the Baptists in Texas uh, was a member of your church. Uh, Phil Strickland, many of you will remember, uh, was uh, lobbied for the Christian Life Commission for 38 years, uh, he, and his uh, legacy is still very much with us. I would not be here today, personally or professionally, uh, if it was not for Phil Strickland. On a personal note, I grew up here. We're a very thinking church. Uh, the Call Answers program, a lot of the uh, uh, mentoring programs uh, for the youth, for college age, for pastoral residency program. Uh, I'm a product of that. And I remember uh, going to a Christmas party at George's house uh, when I was in college, and he asked me, he said, uh, you know, he was just checking in with me, and I said, I was thinking about law school. He said, well, what happened to seminary? And I said, well, I was just kind of leaning towards law school. And he goes, why is it an either or, Josh? And I never thought of it that way, as a both and. And he says, have you met Phil Strickland? About a year later, I was on, on, I guess I wasn't on staff, I was interning as a minister of missions uh, when Karen Gilbert was the minister of missions here, and I began to have a lot of questions about why the people we were serving in a missions capacity were uh, in need, and I began to have those kind of questions about policy, thinking about uh, not just throwing life preservers to people that are caught in a river, uh, but questioning why there were so many people in the river and why I didn't have enough life preservers for them all, and I had to go upstream and figure out why are they ended up in the river in the first place. Uh, and as I was having those questions and in that discernment process, Karen said, have you talked to Phil Strickland yet? 
So I finally did. And uh, anyway, he became the model for my career. Now, professionally, I would not, uh, Texas Impact would not be here if it was not for Phil Strickland. So there are th kind of three big religious groups in the state, uh, at the state capitol, that work on public policy issues. The Christian Life Commission being the public policy arm of the Baptist that Phil worked for. Uh, the Catholic, uh, have the Catholic Conference uh, that represents the bishops. And in 1973, Phil helped the mainline Protestant community, so Methodists, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Presbyterians. There's a lot, big old long list on our website if you're curious. Uh, helped them kind of get together and think, they had a thing called a Conference of Churches. And uh, Texas Impact became their public policy arm. And Phil Strickland sat on our board for at least three decades, maybe four. Uh, and was very involved in that kind of ecumenical efforts. And whenever all those faith groups speak together, it's just a very powerful thing. Well, the legacy of Phil Strickland continues to live on in many ways, Josh being one of them, and then our new partner, Texas Impact, I think will feel very familiar to us for, the, the, for that very reason. So Josh, as we're ending today, I'm going to let everybody see your gifts as a lobbyist. Tell us why we should care that the Texas legislature is in session and what challenge would you have for us as individuals in a community of faith in the months ahead? So our top three priorities were going to be public education, which is almost entirely a state issue, uh, health care, uh, and unfortunately we're not really sure what, I mean, what the future of that holds. Um, a lot of that's waiting on the federal level. Uh, and foster care. And if you've read about uh, foster care in, in the newspapers in Texas, uh, it, it is in a crisis uh, state. We'll also be having to contend with a lot of religious liberty issues um, in the sense of, uh, you've probably seen the news recently about what's going on with the refugee program. Uh, we're seeing a lot of anti-Muslim uh, kind of rhetoric uh, play out at the state level, not just the federal level. We've been seeing that for the last four or five years, actually. Uh, and of course, what affects the religious liberty of any one faith affects the religious liberty of all faiths, including yours. And that's why we have to be concerned about those things. Um, I would urge uh, this congregation to really pay attention to foster care. Um, always. So we work on just about anything where a ministry or mission has some nexus with public policy. And you have any number of wonderful uh, missions that you do. If you pay utility bills, for instance, and you do, because I was a minister of missions intern here, uh, you have to care about how those electric rates get made. Um, if you care about food pantry, you have to care about food policy and that has a downstream effect. Uh, Y'all have a wonderful foster care ministry that I was invited to speak to on Friday night. It was really powerful uh, for me personally because uh, I learned, I discerned a long time ago that I often uh, care too much about individuals and in direct service. It really kind of gets to me. I prefer policy, but I was sitting there with actual foster parents, actual foster kids even, uh, and it was supposed to go for about an hour, uh, and they, didn't leave uh, because they are so directly impacted by the foster care system in the state and they weren't sure how to connect with it. They knew that the decisions state leaders were making were affecting them and their children uh, and they weren't sure what to do about it. And so we sat there for about two and a half hours um, total just chatting about ways that they could get more involved and in advocating for their children because the policies that the state was making was so directly impacting them. Well, if you want to get involved in any of these issues um, during the session, I hope that you will visit. We're going to have a table in James Gallery, and there should be cards in your Sunday school boxes where you can sign up to receive email updates throughout the session on the issues that you are most passionate about. And then on Mondays at noon in February and April um, at the church, we are going to be live streaming legislative updates from Texas Impact in the Capitol so that we can actually um, act on some of the issues that we care about. And so more information will be coming out soon on that. Thank you, Josh, for coming Thank and sharing with us. Me.